Tonight, the dramatic new look at that active shooter inside the terminal at Dallas Love Field. The suspect opens fire near the ticket counter. You can see the alleged shooter raising the gun in the air and firing, sending a crowded terminal cowering behind seats. Fortunately, no bystanders were hurt. President Trump returns to Washington, D.C. for the first time since leaving office. Why a former top aide is urging Trump supporters not to go. And all this while Trump is weighing a new bid at the White House. And his former VP Mike Pence is also in D.C. speaking at a different conference. Is there a rift in the Republican Party? Tonight, the deadly flash flooding in the heartland. Some communities near St. Louis see more than a foot of rain. Emergency responders forced to rescue victims trapped in cars and homes. And the gruesome discovery at Lake Mead as record droughts and the effect of climate change continue to take hold. Tonight, the announcement by Russia that could end two decades of post-Cold War cooperation in space. Back here on Earth, the latest developments in the Brittany Griner trial. The WNBA superstar in court in Russia today. The message she had for her wife back home in the United States. And America is losing its nuns. Less than 1% of the sisters are now under the age of 40. Our in-depth report on what's being done to ensure the nuns continue to thrive and more young women answer the call to serve. How does the sisterhood get more sisters who are in your age group? That is the question for the ages. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Tonight, we are tracking a flooding emergency in the heartland, and we're getting a look at dramatic new video from that shooting at Love Field in Dallas. But we begin tonight with former President Trump's first trip back to Washington, D.C., since leaving office. Trump addressed a conservative group. He spoke about public safety and continued to air many prior grievances about the direction of the country. Trump also continued to dwell on the past and repeat lies that the 2020 election was stolen. Across town, his former vice president addressed a different conservative group and urged his party to focus on the future and conservative values. The elephant in the room, of course, the looming prospect of a 2024 campaign which could pit the former running mates against each other in a crowded field of candidates. You'll remember it was that crowded field scenario that pundits credit, at least in part, with helping Trump to win the nomination in 2016. Our congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott, leads us off tonight from Washington. It's been just days since America learned that as his supporters rampaged through the Capitol for more than three hours, <laughs> Donald Trump sat in his private dining room, watching it all unfold on television, not taking the 60-second walk to the briefing room, where there's always a camera live and ready to go to tell the rioters to go home. Still today, as Trump returned to Washington for the first time since leaving office, his message, law and order. We're living in such a different country for one primary reason. There is no longer respect for the law, and there certainly is no order. But the day after the insurrection, the January 6th committee says Trump crossed out lines in his speech about punishing the rioters. The committee asking his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, why that happened. It looks like here that, that he crossed out. Uh, that he was directing the Department of Justice to ensure all lawbreakers are prosecuted to the full extent of the law. We must send a clear message, not with mercy, but with justice. Legal consequences must be swift and firm. Do you know why he wanted that crossed out? Uh, I don't know. In that January 7th speech, Trump could not even bring himself to say the election was over. But this election is now over. Congress has certified the results. I don't want to say the election's over. I just want to say... Congress has certified the results without saying the election's over, okay? Trump repeating his election lies today. But this morning, also in Washington, a very different message from former Vice President Mike Pence, who was raced to safety just feet from the mob. Pence's message to the Republican Party, move on. I don't, I don't know that the president and I differ on issues. But we may differ on focus. I truly do believe that elections are about the future and that it's absolutely essential at a time when so many Americans are hurting, so many families are struggling, that we don't give way to the temptation to look back. It comes after ABC News was the first to report that Pence's former chief of staff, Mark Short, testified before the federal grand jury investigating the riot, Short appearing on ABC News Live. If the mob had gotten closer to the vice president, I do think there would have been a massacre in the Capitol that day.
Yeah, Mark Short sharing that sentiment with us last night here on Prime. Rachel Scott joins us now from Washington. And Rachel, the difference in tone between the former running mates, quite striking, really on full display in those speeches today, as they both appear to have ambitions for 2024. Yeah, a split screen happening here right in Washington, D.C. as former President Donald Trump returned to the nation's capital for the first time since leaving office, also having his former Vice President Mike Pence, who he is completely at odds with at this moment, still frustrated over what happened on January 6th, but also deeply divided over the future and the direction of the Republican Party. I can tell you by talking to many Republicans up on Capitol Hill, there is a lot of nervousness about whether or not Donald Trump would announce before the midterms and and then he, you have him repeating these election lies at this event today, but Pence making it clear that the way for the party to win in 2022 and beyond is to move on from those election lies, Lizzie. To look forward, but no telling what Donald Trump will do. Rachel Scott, our thanks to you as always. Joining us now for more is the former spokesperson for the Justice Department during the early years of the Trump administration and ABC News contributor Sarah Isker. Sarah, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, former President Trump returned to D.C. for the first time since leaving office. Let's take a listen to part of his speech. I'm here before you to begin to talk about what we must do to achieve that future. When we win a triumphant victory in 2022 and when a Republican president takes back the White House in 2024. Whether all Republicans like this or not, would you say that former President Trump is definitively the mantle holder for the party still? I would. You know, we've seen some softening of support for Donald Trump, but by softening, we mean still around 50 percent of Republican primary voters say they're interested in Donald Trump running in 2024. The closest runner up, Ron DeSantis, at about 25 percent, still way ahead of the rest of the field, Mike Pence and others in single digits. So no question Donald Trump is still the the most famous Republican, obviously, and the Republican that Republican primary voters probably trust the most at this point. His former VP, Mike Pence, gave a dueling speech today at a different conference. Let's take a listen to part of what he had to say. I don't know that our movement is that divided. I don't know that the president and I differ on issues. But we may differ on focus. I truly do believe that elections are about the future. And Sarah, we asked the question last night to Mark Short. Do you think if Trump runs a possible divided field, including Vice President Pence, will play right into his hands again? Well, I just have flashbacks to 2016. You know, I was on Carly Fiorina's campaign. We had 17 candidates running for president in that race. And it doesn't take very many then for the front runner to win that nomination. Donald Trump won the Republican nomination with a very small plurality of Republican voters. If Republican candidates do that again in 2024, absolutely Donald Trump, I think, will be the nominee. The opportunity for someone like Vice President Pence, who's well respected, well regarded within the party, even if voters don't necessarily want him to be the nominee for president, is to get all those Republicans in a room and say, if you are serious about Donald Trump not being the future of the Republican Party, we all need to get behind a single candidate. And we've heard Pence say that he doesn't think that the movement is all that divided. Do you agree with that, especially what we've been hearing, you know, uh, over the course of these months from the, the, the January 6th hearings and what the committee has brought forth, especially watching just how close, I mean, Mark Short told us last night that he felt that if the crowd had gotten closer to Pence that day, there would have been a massacre in the Capitol. This is the political tightrope that Mike Pence has been trying to walk now since they left office, trying to embrace his years as Donald Trump's vice president while trying to draw that separation and distinction for his own political future. Would a potential Trump 2024 campaign announcement complicate the decision that Merrick Garland and the DOJ are facing as far as whether or not to pursue criminal charges against the former president who could soon become candidate Trump? Well, at the Department of Justice, you know, these aren't uh, in stone guidelines, but generally speaking, after September, the department usually waits to get involved in any sort of uh, candidate related indictment or investigation to take more investigatory steps. What we've seen so far from the department is not that they're focused on the former president, particularly on that idea of incitement that the former president caused the violence on January 6th. We've seen no real steps from the department on that. What we've seen are 15 people in and around the president uh, with certain 
search warrants, subpoenas around that fake elector idea. Plenty of federal statutes around fraud involving those electors. But we haven't seen them take any steps toward the president, so I'm not sure it's all that important to them one way or the other when he mm -hmm. announces. That's interesting. As the Justice Department, though, continues that sweeping investigation into January 6th, how significant is reporting that was broken by ABC News that Mark Short had testified under oath to the grand jury investigating the attack? Well, I mean, one of the strongest points for both the January 6th committee and the Department of Justice is how many people in and around Donald Trump's closest circle have provided testimony about what Donald Trump was doing that day and, again, what some of those other people around him were doing that day. I do think that when it comes to criminal charges, of course, the January 6th committee far more focused on the political, moral implications of what Donald Trump did as president. But it'll be up to the Department of Justice to decide whether any laws were broken. All right, Sarah Isker, our thanks to you once again for joining the show. There are new developments tonight in that airport shooting scare at Dallas Love Field Airport. This newly released surveillance and body cam video shows the moment the suspect fired her weapon into the air. The gunshot you see there sent passengers running and ducking for cover. Our Gio Benitez joins us now with the latest. Tonight, dramatic new video from inside Dallas Love Field Airport as a woman opens fire. Watch surveillance cameras capture her arriving in a red Uber vehicle, entering the airport wearing a black hoodie. Just before 11 a.m., she walks into a bathroom. Five minutes later, she exits and wanders into the ticketing area. Started to ramble, talking about a marriage, incarceration, and that she was going to blow up the airport, and then pulls a handgun from her sweatshirt. Then the first shots fired. Her arm raised, the crowd runs for cover, crouching behind seats. Authorities say the suspect then pointed the gun at a veteran Dallas police officer and a bystander. Officer Cronin took cover behind a ticket kiosk and fired his department-issued weapon, striking the suspect multiple times. That officer striking her lower extremities and she falls. Officers move in, body camera video capturing her arrest. The shooter taken to the hospital for treatment. Police tonight say she is 37-year-old Portia Odafua, and the weapon was not registered to her. Since August 2018, she's been prohibited from possessing a firearm. Law enforcement officials saying she has a history of mental health issues and had previously been arrested for arson and bank robbery, but both charges were dropped. She had also been apprehended at Love Field once before. On September 28, 2020, the suspect was detained for an APAL, which stands for Apprehension by Peace Officer Without a Warrant, at Love Field and transported for a mental health evaluation. And, Lindsay, the investigation is still underway. We don't know why the shooter opened fire, but police say that Uber driver was not involved. Meanwhile, tonight, there are major questions about how she got that gun. Lindsay. And the motive there still unclear. Geo, our thanks to you. Extreme weather is wreaking havoc across the country once again tonight. St. Louis is recovering from historic floods there. More than eight inches of rain broke an all-time daily record. Dozens of people had to be rescued from high waters. One person was found dead inside their flooded car. This comes as an oppressive heat wave presses the Pacific Northwest. Temperatures in parts of Texas have reached more than 100 degrees for more than three weeks at this point. And in Oregon, the the governor there has declared a state of emergency due to the heat. ABC senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is tracking it all for us. Tonight, that historic rainfall event in the heartland, a deadly flash flood emergency across the St. Louis area. People trapped in the water before dawn as the rain kept coming down. Now what one is on the way. Hold on, man. Hold on. Rescuers responding to calls as fast as they can. Several vehicles were reported completely submerged underwater. You have the overpass uh, ahead of us, and you can see some of the conditions. Apartment buildings flooding. That's the kitchen. Don't get me started on the living room. Training thunderstorms unleashing more than a foot of rain in some areas. More than 100 people rescued across the region. Tragically, one person dying in a flooded vehicle. Our dispatchers are working overtime, our police officers, our firemen, our SEMA, everyone's working overtime to handle um, this, this emergency. Parts of multiple interstates shut down, including I-70. The road is completely flooded. And this Metro Link station completely inundated. The once-in-a-thousand-year event caused by that stationary front 
fueled by record-breaking heat from the plains to the west, where it's fueling the Oak Fire in Mariposa County, California, now burning more than 18,000 acres. Our Alex Perche is there. You see crews taking this tree down right now. They had to. It suffered so much fire damage, it was a threat to any car driving down this road. In fact, firefighters call those trees widow makers. And in Balch Springs outside Dallas, where that fast-moving grass fire damaged or destroyed more than two dozen homes Monday. Officials believe the fire ignited by sparks from a grass cutting crew. Extreme drought making every spark a danger. The last measurable rain in the area on June 3rd more than 50 days ago. 23 out of 26 days so far this month have been over 100 degrees. Such a long stretch of extreme heat. Our senior meteorologist Rob Marciano joins us tonight from Portland, Oregon. Rob, there's still a lot of concern about these storms potentially colliding with the heat. What does the forecast look like at this point? Well, this front, and this time of year, these fronts don't move very fast, if at all. So it's a stalled front, a stationary boundary, and it's not moving very much. And we've got a couple of pieces of energy at the upper levels that will trigger more uh, showers and thunderstorms and maybe training thunderstorms like we had in the St. Louis area. Although I think most of this should be south of where the, the worst flooding is. Doesn't mean it can't be bad. We've got flood watches that are posted for much of the Ohio River Valley uh, tonight and until this thing ends, really for the next two days, I think we'll see the rain here. And as you, as you know, it's been extremely uh, hot below this and that's kind of adding fuel to the fire here. Warnings for heat are up in Memphis and Oklahoma again. Many towns in Texas, they're en route to record streaks of 100 degree plus temperatures. And now here in the Pacific Northwest, typically a very cool temperate climate in the summertime. We are in the oven. Record challenging temperatures today and triple digit heat uh, looks like the entire week. Uh, cooling centers uh, have been open here. The governor, as you've probably mentioned, has declared a state of emergency because, and this could go down as one of the longest heat waves, uh, if not the longest heat wave in, uh, in Portland. Now down to the south in the southern part of the state where it's even hotter, some of the smoke from the fires in California, the Oak Fire particularly, is drifting up into the into the heat zone. And you know what happens there? We get the heat, we get those particles in the air, we get ozone, we get bad air quality. So on southern, in Southern Oregon, it's even worse, Lindsay. Wow, just punishing all around. Rob Marciano, our thanks to you. You bet. More fallout in Uvalde, Texas. The principal of Robb Elementary School has been suspended with pay after a legislative report claimed that she knew there were security problems with the school before 19 children and two teachers were gunned down. ABC's Maria Villarreal is in Texas tonight with more on that and new video that shows officers arriving at the school the day of the attack even sooner than originally reported. Tonight, the newest figure under the microscope in Uvalde, the principal at Robb Elementary now suspended with pay, just a week after a state investigation detailed a botched police response and school security failures. I'm just concerned for my families and my kids. The report, finding Mandy Gutierrez and other employees widely knew the lock to classroom 111 was broken, but never had it fixed before the gunman walked in and killed 19 students and two teachers. Investigators say the school had a culture of non-compliance with safety policies requiring doors to be kept locked. Teachers often used rocks to prop open exterior doors and left interior doors unlocked for convenience. At the latest school board meeting, families demanding accountability and details on new security measures. It's not about extra security. Over 400 officers and 77 minutes later already proved where that got us. Their children are traumatized. They sleep with their parents. They do not want to go to school. Some parents walking out in protest. Brett Cross lost his 10-year-old nephew, Usiah Garcia. Two months, finally, after I asked and asked and asked, finally said, well, everybody messed up, but we messed up. They couldn't even accept that and say, yo, we messed up. Still not taking full accountability. Maria Villarreal joins us now. Maria, we mentioned body camera video that shows a DPS trooper arriving on the scene earlier than officially reported. What kinds of questions are the DPS facing tonight? Well, you know, Lindsay, DPS is definitely in the hot seat today. Take a look at this picture. So this is a state trooper in the school's doorway five minutes earlier than what DPS Director Stephen McCraw testified to. And today, DPS is fielding questions, tough ones, about why they said a trooper wasn't on scene until 1142, when this image clearly shows that they were there 
at 1137. Today, DPS wouldn't address this directly, but they did say they continue to investigate the actions of all of their officers on that day. Lindsay? Still so much variation in the accounts. Maria Villarreal, our thanks to you. Tonight, the fallout from the war in Ukraine has reached all the way to outer space. Russia announced today that it is ending decades of cooperation with the U.S. and will withdraw as a partner in the International Space Station in 2024. Just this month, the U.S. and Russia struck a deal to allow astronauts from both agencies to ride to the ISS on each other's spacecraft. This decision throws into doubt NASA's previous plans to keep the space station operating through the end of the decade. Our thanks to Ian Panel. WNBA star Brittany Griner was back in a Russian courtroom today, continuing her drawn-out trial on drug charges. The hearing only lasted 40 minutes, and what turned out to be the most meaningful moment was Griner's message for her wife. She held up a clear plastic envelope with photos of Sherelle Griner inside. The 31-year-old two-time Olympic gold medalist had this to say when she spoke to an ABC producer in Moscow. Do you want to say something to Sherelle? Good luck on the bar exam. How do you feel? Do you have any complaints? No, no complaints. Wait patiently. To help us understand what's happening and what will happen next, William Pomerantz, the acting director of the Wilson Center Kennan Institute, he joins us now. Thank you so much for joining us. So court resumes for Griner tomorrow. Do you think that her trial will, will play out in full before Russia comes to the table with any real prisoner swap proposal or, or deal for a release? Yes, there will not be a prisoner release until the trial is over, and that means that the trial will have to end uh, essentially with conviction because it's not going to be any other result. And but really, trial, nearly all of the cases in Russia do end in conviction, is that right? Yes. A Griner pleaded guilty to the drug charges against her. If she's already pleaded guilty, what is her legal team hoping to prove? I think they're trying to prove some sort of le get some sort of leniency in the sentence, and I think she's she's the team is also trying to prove uh, that there was a me medicinal value or purpose for her having these uh, cartridges. So I think they're just trying to get some sort of extenuating circumstances before the judge to see if that can make a difference. And Brittany Griner is expected to testify tomorrow. What do you think that we might hear from her? I'm not quite sure what she's going to say. I think she's going to basically kind of say what she's been saying in the interview that you uh, had before, that she's patient, that she's ready to kind of deal with the Russian legal system, whatever it results uh, happen, and that um, she will um, abide by the decision. Uh, I think that's what her legal team has been trying to put forward, and I think that's what she will do when she testifies. If she is convicted, she faces up to 10 years in prison with the right to appeal. The U.S. Department of State has classified her case as wrongfully detained. If she receives that maximum sentence, what can the United States do at that point to bring her home? Very little. It will become a diplomatic discussion. And it will only be through dipl diplomatic negotiations that Brittany can come home. And that will be a very tough assignment, especially during these times when Russia and the United States are really not talking. What would those negotiations look like? We've seen that end with uh, some modicum of success uh, a few months ago. It will require a long negotiation process. I do not believe that it will be a quick process. Um, I think the United States has complicated the, the negotiations by not only wanting to get Brittany Griner home, but also Paul Whelan. And so it will mean that uh, they will have to basically have two people and two exchanges, and that will be a very difficult uh, circumstances going forward. All right. William Pomerantz, our thanks to you. Really appreciate your time and insight. My pleasure. When we come back, authorities are looking for clues and are desperate for witnesses to come forward after a fight over a referee's call during a soccer match that turned deadly. The unfortunate statistic with regard to monkeypox that has the U.S. leading. But up next, we have the latest on Pope Francis's high-stakes Canadian trip to right wrongs that were committed decades ago. And we're also looking inward here at home. Why so few women are deciding to become nuns? The looming potential crisis in the Catholic Church. Next.
With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The hottest news in daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to see. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. America is being poisoned with fentanyl, and we don't even know it. Just heard my wife screaming. She told me they had just died. 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Keep breathing, come on. It's poison, it's pure poison. A few grains of salt worth of fentanyl will kill you. Just my agency has seized enough to kill the entire country. ABC News Live presents Poisoned, America's Fentanyl Crisis, the powerful series, streaming free on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7, there for you with one touch. The ABC News app, download it now. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Pope Francis held a big Canadian mass one day after his historic apology for the wrongs the Catholic Church committed decades ago to that nation's indigenous communities. The church has been accused of severing generations of families from each other through schools that it ran. Emotions were still raw one day later at today's service. While some cheered the pontiff's arrival, others said that his apology didn't go far enough because it didn't address the wrongs committed during European colonialism and assimilation policies that critics argued the church readily supported. Speaking of the church, while it may not be at the forefront of your mind for the dwindling group of America's nuns, it's a major issue. Simply put, there aren't enough of them, and they're having a hard time convincing younger women to take their vows. What does this mean for the future of the sisterhood? Our senior national correspondent, Steve Osinsami, has this in-depth report. On this Saturday afternoon in Cincinnati, 32-year-old Colleen O'Toole is making an agreement with her God. In a moment that's becoming more and more unusual for a young woman in America, she's becoming a nun. The star I have for you today is called a big mooncake for little star. But Sister Colleen is a lifetime away from the cloistered nuns now in the sunset of their lives in convents that are closing left and right across America. She has subscribers to her videos on YouTube where she's known as Story's sister and reads to children. Is this a true to life story about Martin Luther King? Do you know who that is? On Instagram, like many people her age, she shares pictures of her food and cute photos with sunflowers, rainbows, and cupcakes. Sister Colleen, receive this ring. There's concern today that young people aren't interested anymore in a life of religious service. Between you and your God. 
and that there's a crisis in the Catholic sisterhood. Less than 1% of the sisters are under 40, and the average age of the American nun is now 80 years old. We had to make those outfits. Sister Joanne Purse just turned 88 and says that so many of her friends who joined her in service in the early 1950s have gone home to the Lord. She knows what's happening, but says it's wrong to say that the place nuns have in society is going away. It's changing and growing into something we can't even imagine. But this year, there are now fewer than 42,000 nuns in America, down 76% from the days when they were so celebrated that on this very network, nuns could fly. I do not want you to fly while a bishop is on the island. You mean I'm grounded? More than any other religious servant of God, the Catholic nun arguably still holds a special place in the hearts and minds of people around the world. Mother Teresa was a nun in the church long before she was a noun in every dictionary, describing a person who is selfless and kind. I have a place you can hide. In the movies, it's the nuns who help families escape from the Nazis. Freeze! Leave them alone. They don't and help hide witnesses to crimes from the mob. But at the rate the sisters are disappearing, one estimate says there will be fewer than 1,000 nuns left in the United States in 20 years. God's got big plans, and hopefully we follow them. <laughs> Sister Kelly Williams is working to become one of those nuns still in the life. She's 34 years old and started her journey nine years ago. She's put in more hours than she can count of community service and Catholic studies. Hey, you get this a lot, right? Yeah. Okay, what am I about to say? Like, I look very young. Yes. And I'm dressed normally. Yes. Or as normally as one does. <laughs> yes. How can I do this? Because um, that's... Do I watch television? Yes. Okay, you, you know. watch television. Yes, do I watch Netflix? Or specifically in our house, we don't have cable, but we have, like, okay. Netflix and Hulu and all of the things, you know? But, you know, you don't really go out to bars, or do you? Or? Not I, I don't go out to bars like I would have when I was in college. I think I've had people be, cons like, surprised that, like, I like to listen to music and not all of it is religious, you know? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> She's a former college admissions counselor who lives in a Chicago apartment with four other sisters close to her age. As we pray together. She expects to take her final vows in a few years, officially becoming a Catholic sister with the Sisters of Mercy, one of the largest religious orders for Catholic women still left in the world. And she says she's not giving up her Facebook, Instagram, or TikTok accounts. I started making videos every Saturday. I make, you're welcome to follow it along. It's called Saturday Sister Surprise. What do you think I might have hidden in my hair today? Is it? A 14 pound turkey? Yes, it is. Something that has brought a lot of joy to people. And every time I go, okay, I think maybe this is time to like end it, I'll get a message of someone who's saying like, I've had a really hard week and I look forward to Saturdays. And I'm like, oh, then this is where I, we do this. I feel like I should probably get a better view. <laughs> How does the sisterhood get more sisters who are in your age group? That is the question for the ages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I don't know that I have the answer to it because I think the reality is there was a time in history when people entered in droves. And sometimes because they had no other place to go. There are so many options that are available. It's about being called to this. Like, I, if I could, if it was about recruitment, right. you could be in a different game. I see. But you aren't. Yeah. This yes. is about God's call and responding to that. But part of that means, like, how do I talk about my experience as a religious so that someone else can go, oh, wait, I, I think I've heard things like this but I didn't know what it was. And maybe this is my own call. She and her roommates explain that young people today are more resistant to the structure of religious life and that many are turned off by the scandals of the Catholic Church. And they say that even though the Catholic sisters haven't been required to wear religious clothing since the 1960s, there's a tradition that frames what they do and who they are that as young people, they struggle to work past. The American memory is attached to the nun of yesteryear. Yeah. You know, and it's very hard for us now to kind of be breaking through those stereotypes that were established 50, 60 plus years ago. So we are still kind of fighting that battle as younger religious to say, this is what a typical American nun looks like 
in today's world. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They pray every day for their future, asking for strength, hope, and more young women to answer the call. Blessed our sister. As their scriptures tell them, God has plans. And empower her to be a living witness of your love to all your people. Our thanks to Steve for that. Still ahead here on Prime, what does the next generation of COVID vaccines look like and when will they be available? The incredible video, the endangered seal attacking a terrified swimmer and it was all caught on tape. And did you buy a Mega Millions ticket? We take a look at the odds by the numbers. But first, our tweet from the day from Connecticut Senator Chris Murphy. He initially demanded action after news broke that Choco Tacos would no longer be sold. He later said sorry for that joke that set off a Twitter firestorm. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> I you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. America is being poisoned with fentanyl, and we don't even know it. Just heard my wife screaming. She told me they had just died. 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Keep breathing, come on. It's poison, it's pure poison. A few grains of salt worth of fentanyl will kill you. Just my agency has seized enough to kill the entire country. ABC News Live presents Poisoned, America's Fentanyl Crisis, the powerful series streaming free on ABC News Live. These days, with so much going on, it's hard to keep up. While others are recapping yesterday's headlines, we're bringing you the right now. This is the busy border crossing. Steel barricades, another strike. The right now look at the day ahead, how it affects you and your family. Record high gas prices. The threat of cyber warfare. Is peace possible? World News Now beginning at 2 a.m. Eastern, followed by America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Streaming here on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7, there for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated abcnews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at abcnews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Welcome back, everyone. The Mega Millions jackpot rose once again today. It was boosted by strong ticket sales as millions try their luck. Let's take a look at how much a single winner could take home by the numbers. The jackpot is now at $830 million. If someone wins, Mega Millions says it would be the third largest prize in the game's history. If the winner takes the cash option, it would go down to $487.9 million, but they still have even more deductions to consider. They'd have about $100 117 million dollars taken out for federal taxes and then they'd have to consider state taxes as well the largest mega millions jackpot ever reached one and a half billion dollars that was back in october of 2018 a single winning ticket was sold in south carolina the highest in history was 1.6 billion dollar powerball jackpot back in january 2016 three winners from different states split that prize one mega millions ticket is two dollars but many try to increase their likelihood of winning 
winning by buying more. While purchasing a chance at the jackpot doesn't have to be expensive, the odds are hard to beat. You have a one in 303 million chance of winning the Mega Millions jackpot. You're about 20,000 times more likely to be struck by lightning. If you win, experts say your first step should be getting a tax attorney and financial advisor. Drawings are held each Tuesday and Friday. Good luck to everybody. You got to pay to play. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime. The remnants of a Chinese rocket are expected to fall to Earth soon. The key detail officials still don't know. A decision is making feline lovers furious. Why a group of scientists are classifying cats as an invasive species. A romantic movie with a message. Singer and actress Sophia Carson explains how this love story is tackling some important issues. But first, a look at our top trending stories on ABCnews.com. So much at stake in our world right now. We wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. California's oak fire swelling once again overnight. What we've seen is just explosive fire behavior. It's a challenge for us to get in there. The oak fire now the state's largest this season, torching at least 21 structures, jeopardizing thousands more and forcing more than 6,000 people to evacuate. More than 2,500 firefighters working around the clock to control the blaze. Battling the intense heat and steep terrain. Planes dropping retardant trying to stop the spread from air. Take that, that moisture out of the vegetation, you have these volatile uh, conditions, and that's really what's driving this fire. In Texas, a huge grass fire destroying at least two dozen homes in the Dallas suburb of Balch Springs. Conditions there extremely dry. From what we understand, there was a spark that started the whole thing from the mowers, and it just spread to the houses. Then in Missouri, Crazy. summer storms dumping more than 12 inches of rain in just five hours on St. Louis, causing widespread flash flooding. This train station nearly swallowed by the floodwaters and crews rescuing multiple people by boat after several cars were trapped in high water. We have pulled a, uh, a civilian out of a vehicle that has passed, so we do have one fatality from this fast rising water. Meanwhile, the Northeast seeing some relief from that brutal heat, but millions more still battling the high temperatures. 
The CDC says the U.S. now has more than 3,800 known cases of monkeypox, more than any other country. Biden administration says hundreds of thousands of doses are coming as they face backlash after a new report reveals 300,000 doses sat in a warehouse in Denmark. The nation's top health experts are planning for the next generation of vaccines. The White House hosted a summit today looking at cutting-edge vaccines, including a nasal dose option that would prevent infection. Our job is not to develop a vaccine. We are not a vaccine production company. Our job is to facilitate by providing our scientists, brilliant scientists, many of whom are in this room right now, with the capability and the support to pursue the scientific leads. The panel also talked about ways to ensure access to all Americans. Dr. Anthony Fauci urged Congress to act on funding. And finally, ending with something we all know. The cost of major investment of research pales in comparison to the cost of a pandemic. A 29-year-old soccer player has died two weeks after he was assaulted during a brawl involving players and spectators on a field at Oxnard High School in California. Misal Sanchez was initially listed in critical condition, but Oxnard police say he died early Monday morning. The mass fight apparently started with a dispute between two adult soccer teams over a referee's decision. Police say players began brawling and some spectators joined in as well. Police are still looking for more suspects in the brawl. Reports that China's latest rocket launched into space will fall back to Earth in an unknown location are raising concern. The rocket is in an uncontrolled descent toward Earth, nearing the atmosphere while rotating in orbit. This is the third time the country is accused of not properly handling space debris on its descent back into Earth. And the Polish Academy of Sciences says domestic cats are, quote, an invasive alien species. The experts there say pet cats can harm biodiversity by the sheer number of birds and other animals they hunt and kill. Welcome back. A startling discovery in Nevada's Lake Mead as water levels there continue to fall. A report that more human remains have been found. Two others were found back in April. Lake Mead is a vital source of water for millions of people in Arizona, California, and Nevada. Now it's just a quarter of its overall capacity. Here's ABC's Kana Whitworth. Tonight, the astonishing discovery, a third set of human remains emerging from the ever-shrinking waters of Lake Mead. A visitor making the gruesome discovery on the lake's Nevada side Monday, according to the National Park Service. Officials seen removing the remains early this morning. What started with me the most is how recent, like if they're recent bodies or if they've been there for a long time. Because if it's more recent, that kind of scares me more. This comes after two additional bodies were found in May. The drastic difference seen in these images released by NASA. This is what the lake looked like in 2000 and this image from just a couple of weeks ago. The nation's largest reservoir reaching its lowest level ever due to a mega drought made worse by climate change. This sunken World War II era Higgins boat also surfacing earlier this month because of the ongoing drought. The Park Service telling ABC News they expect even more discoveries to come. It's a big place and it's got a long history and um, most certainly people were buried in, in this area. I'm positive that, that other artifacts and things will be found over the years. Just astounding what they keep finding there. Kana Whitworth joins us now. Kana, the lake provides drinking water for 25 million people. Do experts anticipate that the water levels will just continue dropping there? They do, Lindsay, and that's obviously very concerning. We're at a critical point right here as officials believe that lake level will continue dropping for at least the next year. But what's coming up here is summer's end. And by summer's end, they anticipate that farmers that grow most of the fruits and vegetables in this country could be looking at additional cuts as well. Lindsay, that water is responsible for irrigating some 4.5 million acres of farmland. Wow, just incredible. Kana, our thanks to you as always. There is such a thing as being at the wrong place at the wrong time, and then there is this. Take a look as an endangered monk seal appears to have been protecting its pup when it went after the woman swimming in the waters of Hawaii. ABC's Eva Pilgrim joins us with more on the frightening encounter that was all caught on camera. No, no. Oh! A terrifying encounter in the ocean caught on camera. Oh! 
A Hawaiian monk seal known as Rocky, who'd recently given birth, chasing a swimmer who got too close to her pup. At one point, the mama seal pulling the woman down into the water, biting her. Get out! Get out! According to officials, the swimmer's husband recorded this video showing the 60-year-old elementary school teacher swimming off in the distance when the seals suddenly head her way. He says due to her swim cap, she couldn't see them or hear the shouts until it was too late. Oh, Susan. Eventually pulled to safety by a canoeist. I have never in my life seen something like that. The biggest hero in this equation is the guy who came with his outrigger canoe, risking his own health. But the danger was not over. Get out of the way. As they got to shore, Rocky coming back toward the woman, a small group rushing her out of the water onto the sand. It was a brutal attack. It, it was brutal. Uh, it was rough to watch. She, at one point, her Rocky's mouth, I think, got a hold of her head and she was trying to splash and get away. Hawaii Marine Animal Response has been monitoring Rocky and her two-week-old pup, fencing and signs up telling everyone to stay at least 150 feet away. A Hawaiian monk seals, especially a mom and a pup, with a pup can be aggressive towards people, uh, like any wild animal. Uh, she is trying to protect her pup, so we always want to give them their space. Hawaiian monk seals are an endangered species that are federally and state protected. There were only about 1,500 left in the world. Every animal counts, and we want to really make sure that we're protecting these animals. Our thanks to Eva Pilgrim. We are now joined by Sophia Carson, a multi-platinum award-winning singer and songwriter and actor known for roles in Descendants and Pretty Little Liars. On top of all that, she's an ambassador for the Latin Grammy Cultural Foundation and UNICEF. Now she is the star and an executive producer of the new Netflix film, Purple Hearts, about two people with different backgrounds who get married for military benefits, but then ultimately fall in love. Let's take a look. Here's what you need to know about me. Music is my everything. But every time I sit down to write something, all my medical problems get in the way. Dear Cassie, I'm a third generation Marine. I thought that by enlisting, I could earn my dad's respect. Now that I'm actually here, I'm doing it for me. My dear husband. My darling wife. So exciting to take a look at thank this. You. Sophia, thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you for having me. So give us a sense of the film, what it is, and what attracted you to it. This film is a really beautiful and powerful love story. I play Cassandra Salazar, a pretty incredible, remarkable young woman who is you know, the daughter of an immigrant, a type 1 diabetic who's kind of struggling to fight within the system that's fighting against her. And out of desperation to afford her insulin, she ends up getting into a contract marriage for health benefits with a Marine whose name is Luke, who stands for everything she was raised to hate. And our love story kind of takes place in a unique way, it takes place after they've been married and they begin to kind of fall in love and see each other for more than just right and left or red and white, but for human beings. And it's such a, a powerful message that I think the world needs to hear now more than ever. And as you say, you really tackle some of these important themes of the high cost yeah. for prescription medication, Correct. for immigration, yeah. um, struggles with addiction, as also not just an actress in the movie, but also an executive producer. How much responsibility did you feel to, to really get it right when, when conveying these themes? An immense amount of responsibility. And I think Liz, my incredible director, who I could not have done it without this, without her, that was our goal, was to lead with honesty and truth and vulnerability and to be able to really pay tribute to this character, to these stories, and to these incredibly important messages that we were telling in this story. And as I mentioned already, you're a Latin Grammy ambassador. Yes. You also play a Latina musician. Is this really art imitating life a little bit? Interesting. You know, I think I always find it as artists, we find a piece of ourselves in all of the stories that we get to tell. But to me, it was really important that Cassie's, you know, background was really told truthfully and honestly and very much inspired in the relationship between me and my mom. And for instance, how we speak and sometimes English and Spanish and interchange that so often. And um, of course, my, you know, 
dreams of being a writer and a musician are similar to Cassie's and the struggles that I went through as a songwriter and the frustrations. We put a little bit of that into Cassie as well. So it's fun to kind of find that within your characters. What I also find so impressive is all the hats that you wear Thank because you. you not only are an executive producer and an actor and a musician, but you wrote the soundtrack, I right? Did. I'd like to take a listen um, to one of the songs. Beautiful. Thank you. What's the process that, that goes into, and what do you tap into when, when writing a, a soundtrack for like this for Purple? I had never written a soundtrack mm. before. I've been writing music since I was about 10 years old, but always for myself, from my point of view, never to serve a certain purpose in the story or for a different, from a different character's perspective. And so I had the honor that Netflix and Liz and our team confided in me to be able to, to write this soundtrack. And I wrote it with an incredible songwriter, Justin Tranter, who is just iconic, truly. And in order to write these songs, I had to dive into Cassie's heart to bring her story to life through music. And I got to know her really intimately in the process. And it was a whirlwind. We wrote the entire soundtrack in one week. and. Um, it was beautiful. It was such a wild ride. It feels like there are so many aspects of your own life that are reflected here in, mm -hmm. in the movie. What do you hope that viewers will take away from this movie? I hope that they feel identified. I hope that they feel moved. I hope that they feel, um, I hope they fall in love with mm -hmm. the love story and the message behind it. Because when I first read the script, what struck me and what represents, or what the Purple Heart represents is these two hearts, one red, one blue, who were raised in a divided world, a divided country, who through the power of love come together mm. and form a beautiful shade of purple. And um, it's such a message of hope that I think the world needs now, desperately. We certainly yeah. need that message. Sophia, thank you, thank you. so much for joining us. And we want to let our viewers know Purple Hearts premieres this Friday, July 29th on Netflix. And before we go, the image of the day. The 100-year-old wife of baseball icon Jackie Robinson cut the ribbon sign, uh, signaling the opening of the new museum named after her husband in New York. Rachel Robinson was there to see how her barrier-breaking husband's legacy is being honored. The museum not only highlights his many achievements on the field, but also his commitment to civil rights. The Jackie Robinson Museum officially opens to the public on September 5th. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, just how soon could the Senate vote on that bill aimed at protecting the right to same-sex marriage? We have the latest. And Russia plans to take its astronauts off the International Space Station. How its plan for the future could have a major impact on space exploration. That's coming up next. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7, there for you with one touch. The ABC News app, download Load it now. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. The fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7 is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, but an unfriendly adversary? Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over? The world is not going to be the same.
So what's good to read this summer? Well, Kate and I have decided to jump in and help you. And we're talking with Oprah, John Irving, and so many popular authors and influencers. So we want you to join us. Myself, Charlie Gibson, and my daughter, Kate Gibson. Oh, hey, that's me. That is you. For the new podcast series, it is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen anywhere and anytime. The Bookcase Podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. Hi there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. Maine Republican Senator Susan Collins told our Rachel Scott earlier today she thinks she's, quote, very close to finding the 10 GOP votes needed to make the Respect for Marriage Act aimed at protecting the right to same-sex marriage law. Rachel also asked how Collins responds to criticism from colleagues who brand the bill she co-sponsored a waste of time. She claims that's not the reaction she gets when she speaks with her colleagues one-on-one. -on -one. All eyes are once again on the Federal Reserve with officials set to potentially order another interest rate hike in their efforts to curb the inflation that has caused pocketbook woes for millions across the country. This is one of a few crucial economic indicators we'll learn this week, including whether or not our economy grew in the last quarter. By the end of the week, we should have a better sense about if a recession is looming or if the worst of inflation may soon be behind us. And Variety says Ken Jennings and Mayim Bialik signed long-term deals to be the permanent co-hosts of Jeopardy. As we all know, both have been trying to fill the gargantuan shoes of Jeopardy's iconic host, Alex Trebek, who died in 2020 following his battle with pancreatic cancer. Today, former President Trump made his first trip back to Washington, D.C. since leaving office. In a speech, Trump continued to air many prior grievances about the direction of the country and dwell on the past and repeat lies about the 2020 election being stolen. Across town, his former vice president addressed a different conservative group and urged his party to focus on the future and conservative values. Our congressional correspondent Rachel Scott reports. <laughs> It's been just days since America learned that as his supporters rampaged through the Capitol for more than three hours, Donald Trump sat in his private dining room, watching it all unfold on television, not taking the 60-second walk to the briefing room, where there's always a camera live and ready to go to tell the rioters to go home. Still today, as Trump returned to Washington for the first time since leaving office, his message, law and order. We're living in such a different country for one primary reason. There is no longer respect for the law, and there certainly is no order. But the day after the insurrection, the January 6th committee says Trump crossed out lines in his speech about punishing the rioters. The committee asking his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, why that happened. It looks like here that, that he crossed out uh, that he was directing the Department of Justice to ensure all lawbreakers are prosecuted to the full extent of the law. We must send a clear message, not with mercy, but with justice. Legal consequences must be swift and firm. Do you know why he wanted that crossed out? Uh, I don't know. In that January 7th speech, Trump could not even bring himself to say the election was over. But this election is now over. Congress has certified the results. I don't want to say the election's over. I just want to say... Congress has certified the results without saying the election's over, okay? Trump repeating his election lies today. But this morning, also in Washington, a very different message from former Vice President Mike Pence, who was raced to safety just feet from the mob. Pence's message to the Republican Party, move on. I don't, I don't know that the president and I differ on issues. But we may differ on focus. I truly do believe that elections are about the future and that it's absolutely essential at a time when so many Americans are hurting, so many families are struggling, that we don't give way to the temptation to look back. It comes after ABC News was the first to report that Pence's former chief of staff, Mark Short, testified before the federal grand jury investigating the riot, Short appearing on ABC News Live. If the mob had gotten closer to the vice president, I do think there would have been a massacre in the Capitol that day. Mark Short making those comments right here on this show. Our thanks to Rachel Scott. Alarming new data on monkeypox. The CDC says the United States now leads the globe in confirmed cases. More than 3,800 known cases have been reported, and health officials have said it will likely rise as the government increases testing. Here's ABC's Ariel Reshef.
Tonight, reported cases of monkeypox in the U.S. jumping nearly 33 percent in the last four days, up from 2,900 to nearly 3,900. The U.S. now with the most known infections of any country. While stepped up efforts to test and report new cases in the U.S. may account for higher numbers than other countries, experts warn the data is spotty and the real cases are likely much higher. For now, New York considered the epicenter with the most reported infections. Experts say most people getting sick are gay or bisexual men, but the virus is transmitted through direct contact with skin and through droplets from face-to-face -face contact with an infected person for a prolonged period of time. With summer travel underway, the CDC recommending more hand washing and using an alcohol-based sanitizer. So far, there have been no deaths reported in the U.S. The symptoms ranging from fever, headache, rash to blisters usually heal on their own. The U.S. stocking up on the vaccine. We have been working around the clock to ramp up our response and to make important progress in short order. Lots of urgency now. Ariel Reshef joins us. And Ariel, if someone is not recommended to get vaccinated against monkeypox, what other precautions does the CDC recommend that we take in order to try to protect ourselves? Well, Lindsay, the protocol is quite similar to what we've become accustomed to in preventing the spread of COVID-19. Extra hand washing, alcohol-based sanitizer, and of course, avoiding direct contact with anyone who may be infected. Lindsay. All right, Ariel Reshef, our thanks to you. More fallout in Uvalde, Texas. The principal of Robb Elementary School has been suspended with pay after a legislative report claimed that she knew that there were security problems with the school before 19 children and two teachers were killed. ABC's Maria Villarreal is in Texas tonight with new video that shows officers arriving at the school the day of the attack even sooner than originally reported. Tonight, the newest figure under the microscope in Uvalde, the principal at Robb Elementary now suspended with pay, just a week after a state investigation detailed a botched police response and school security failures. I'm just concerned for my families and my kids. The report finding Mandy Gutierrez and other employees widely knew the lock to classroom 111 was broken, but never had it fixed before the gunman walked in and killed 19 students and two teachers. Investigators say the school had a culture of noncompliance with safety policies requiring doors to be kept locked. Teachers often used rocks to prop open exterior doors and left interior doors unlocked for convenience. At the latest school board meeting, families demanding accountability and details on new security measures. It's not about extra security. Over 400 officers and 77 minutes later already proved where that got us. Their children are traumatized. They sleep with their parents. They do not want to go to school. Some parents walking out in protest. Brett Cross lost his 10-year-old nephew, Usaya Garcia. Two months, finally, after I asked and asked and asked, finally said, well, everybody messed up, but we messed up. They couldn't even accept that and say, yo, we messed up. Still not taking full accountability. Our thanks to Maria for that. Tensions from the war in Ukraine have put a decades-long international cooperation in space in serious jeopardy. We've reported extensively on Prime about the diplomatic tension in space. At one point, the Russians threatened to leave Americans on board the space station. And now, tonight, Russia has announced it is ending its partnership with the USS aboard the ISS. Ian Panel reports. And uh, the hatch now opening. Tonight, the fallout from the war in Ukraine reaching into space. Russia ending decades of cooperation with the U.S., saying it'll withdraw as a partner in the International Space Station in 2024. The head of Russia's space agency telling Vladimir Putin today they'll launch their own orbiting station instead. NASA saying the Russians still haven't notified them officially of their plans, but the announcement was expected amid major tensions between America and Russia over the war. It's a dramatic deterioration in relations between Moscow and Washington in which American civilians are also increasingly becoming pawns. Today, American basketball star Brittany Griner was in a Russian courtroom again for her trial on drug charges for carrying vape cartridges containing hashish oil. She was led into a holding cell in the court this morning where she held up a clear plastic envelope containing a photo of her wife. An ABC News producer was able to ask her if she had a message for her wife. Do you want to say something to shout out? Good luck on the bar exam. How do you feel? Do you have any complaints? 
Wait patiently. Gran has pleaded guilty to carrying the vape canisters, which she says she packed accidentally, and her defence argues was for medicinal purposes. She's expected to take the witness stand tomorrow. Amid these tensions, it's been another day of Russian attacks, increasingly not military targets, but civilian ones, as American weapons help Ukraine stall Russia's advance. Lindsay? Ian, thank you. It may not be at the forefront of your mind, but for the dwindling group of America's nuns, it's a major issue. Simply put, there aren't enough of them, and they're having a hard time convincing younger women to take their vows. What does this mean for the future of the sisterhood? Our senior national correspondent, Steve Osinsami, has this in-depth report. On this Saturday afternoon in Cincinnati, 32-year-old Colleen O'Toole is making an agreement with her God. In a moment that's becoming more and more unusual for a young woman in America, she's becoming a nun. The star I have for you today is called a big mooncake for little star. But Sister Colleen is a lifetime away from the cloistered nuns now in the sunset of their lives in convents that are closing left and right across America. She has subscribers to her videos on YouTube where she's known as Story's sister and reads to children. Is this a true to life story about Martin Luther King? Do you know who that is? On Instagram, like many people her age, she shares pictures of her food and cute photos with sunflowers, rainbows, and cupcakes. Sister Colleen, receive this ring. There's concern today that young people aren't interested anymore in a life of religious service. Between you and your God and that there's a crisis in the Catholic sisterhood. Less than 1% of the sisters are under 40, and the average age of the American nun is now 80 years old. We had to make those outfits. Sister Joanne Persh just turned 88 and says that so many of her friends who joined her in service in the early 1950s have gone home to the Lord. She knows what's happening, but says it's wrong to say that the place nuns have in society is going away. It's changing and growing into something we can't even imagine. But this year, there are now fewer than 42,000 nuns in America, down 76% from the days when they were so celebrated <laughs> that on this very network, nuns could fly. I do not want you to fly while a bishop is on the island. You mean I'm grounded? More than any other religious servant of God, the Catholic nun arguably still holds a special place in the hearts and minds of people around the world. Mother Teresa was a nun in the church long before she was a noun in every dictionary, describing a person who is selfless and kind. I have a place you can hide. In the movies, it's the nuns who help families escape from the Nazis. Freeze! Leave them alone. And help hide witnesses to crimes from the mob. But at the rate the sisters are disappearing, one estimate says there will be fewer than a thousand nuns left in the United States in 20 years. God's got big plans. And hopefully we follow them. <laughs> Sister Kelly Williams is working to become one of those nuns still in the life. She's 34 years old and started her journey nine years ago. She's put in more hours than she can count of community service and Catholic studies. Hey, you get this a lot, right? Yeah. Okay, what am I about to say? Like, I look very young. Yes. And I'm dressed normally. Yes. Or as normally as one does. <laughs> yes. How can I do this? Because um, that's... Do I watch television? Yes. Okay. You, you know. watch television. Yes. Do I watch Netflix? Or specifically in our house, we don't have cable, but we have, like, okay. Netflix and Hulu and all of the things, you know? But, you know, you don't really go out to bars, or do you? Or? Not I, I don't go out to bars like I would have when I was in college. I think I've had people be, cons like, surprised that, like, I like to listen to music and not all of it is religious, you know? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> She's a former college admissions counselor who lives in a Chicago apartment with four other sisters close to her age. As we pray together. She expects to take her final vows in a few years, officially becoming a Catholic sister with the Sisters of Mercy, one of the largest religious orders for Catholic women still left in the world. And she says she's not giving up her Facebook, Instagram, or TikTok accounts. I started making videos every Saturday. I make, you're welcome to follow it along. It's called Saturday Sister Surprise. What do you think I might have hidden in my hair today? Is it? 
A 14 pound turkey? Yes, it is. Something that has brought a lot of joy to people. And every time I go, OK, I think maybe this is time to like end it, I'll get a message of someone who's saying, like, I've had a really hard week, and I look forward to Saturdays. And I'm like, oh, then this is where I, we do this. I feel like I should probably get a better view. <laughs> How does the sisterhood get more sisters who are in your age group? That is the question for the ages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I don't know that I have the answer to it, because I think the reality is there was a time in history when people entered in droves. And sometimes because they had no other place to go. There are so many options that are available. It's about being called to this. Like, I, if, I could, if it was about recruitment, right. you could be in a different game. I see. But you aren't. Yeah. This yes. is about God's call and responding to that. But part of that means, like, how do I talk about my experience as a religious so that someone else can go, oh, wait, I, I think I've heard things like this but I didn't know what it was, and maybe this is my own call. She and her roommates explain that young people today are more resistant to the structure of religious life and that many are turned off by the scandals of the Catholic Church. And they say that even though the Catholic sisters haven't been required to wear religious clothing since the 1960s, there's a tradition that frames what they do and who they are that as young people, they struggle to work past. The American memory is attached to the nun of yesteryear. Yeah. You know, and it's very hard for us now to kind of be breaking through those stereotypes that were established 50, 60 plus years ago. So we are still kind of fighting that battle as younger religious to say, this is what a typical American nun looks like in today's world. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They pray every day for their future, asking for strength, hope, and more young women to answer the call. Bless our sister. As their scriptures tell them, God has plans. And empower her to be a living witness of your love to all your people. Our thanks to Steve Osinsami. And still to come, an investigation into deadly drinks, what officials say 28 people consumed before their deaths. Challenging stereotypes in the animal kingdom, a zoologist tells us how her research is pushing back on long-held beliefs about gender roles. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen She's in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. 
With fears growing that Putin will simply cut off the natural gas supply to the EU when winter returns, the bloc agreed to ration its supply to prevent a severe supply shock. The goal is to voluntarily reduce gas usage by 15 percent between August and March of next year. But they also gave a lot of leeway to certain countries, so we'll see what happens. At least 28 people died and others became ill after drinking spiked alcohol in western India. Deaths occurred in a part of that nation where the manufacturing, sale and consumption of liquor is banned. It's not immediately clear what chemical was used to alter the alcohol, but unfortunately, deaths from illegal alcohol in India are relatively common. And in Brazil, hundreds of women marched in Sao Paulo, demanding more government support for marginalized women of color. Many were carrying signs calling for Brazilian President Bolsonaro to be ousted. Many said that he has done very little to help black and brown children in Brazil. That's nations, that nation's contentious presidential election is set for the beginning of October. Now to an author who is challenging long-held beliefs that males in the animal kingdom are the drivers of evolution through competition, sexual strategy, and politics. Author and zoologist Lucy Cook is here to push back against those ideas and give us a dynamic look at the reality behind sex and gender roles in her book on the female species. Lucy, welcome to the show. So I omitted the first word of the title. I'll let you say the title of the book and let our viewers know. It's called Bitch on the Female of the Species. There we go. Let's start off with the idea of male versus female in the animal world. You make a distinction between sex and gender. Explain the difference. Yes, it's really important not to confuse the terms. Uh, most scientists agree that animals don't have gender. It's a human construct, basically. So when I talk about females, I'm talking about biological sex. But some would say they have the different body parts, right, that would correspond as we describe in male or female. Yeah, biological sex is defined by whether you produce egg or sperm. So, so when I say female, I'm referring to an animal that produces eggs. Got it. How has science gotten this so wrong for centuries? Well, it started with Charles Darwin, in fact, who's a hero of mine as an evolutionary biologist. And he was an amazing, meticulous scientist. But he was also a man of his time. And that time was the Victorian era, a time when females didn't have a lot of agency. And so when he came to define the sexes, he basically drew the female of the species in the shape of a Victorian housewife. And what's really fascinating is that somebody who's as brilliant a scientist as Darwin isn't immune to cultural bias. I, I can just imagine that some viewers are home, at home are saying, you know, why does this distinction matter? Why, why do we care? Well, it's, uh, you know, we, we, we care because, um, you know, these, these stereotypes that's, that, that were sort of born out of Victorian misogyny, that females are passive, coy, chaste, and that males are the active, dominant drivers of change, um, you know, they're simply not true. What was incubated in Victorian misogyny gets, um, you know, spat out at humans. So, you know, I think it's very important that we understand the animal kingdom properly. How did you first realize that scientists had gotten sex and gender so wrong? Well, it was funny, actually. It was about, because I studied zoology myself about 30 years ago um, at Oxford under Richard Dawkins, a very famous evolutionary biologist. And I was, I was taught these stereotypes that, that females are, are, are chaste and males are promiscuous. And about sort of 15 years ago, I was, I was in the Serengeti and I was doing an experiment on lion communication and involved playing the sound of a lion's roar into another lion, lion's territory out of, a, out of a small speaker. And basically, I ended up roaring so loudly, I stole a lion's girlfriend, which was not what I expected <laughs> to happen. Um, <laughs> so basically, we, 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 our, our lion's roar attracted three lions, two males and a female. But the female pinned us to the spot for two hours. And, and I was wondered what was going on. And the, the, the expert that I was with at the time said, oh, she wants to mate with us. And he explained that, that female lioness is extremely promiscuous and mates with up to 100 males in, uh, while she's in, in estrus, when she's in heat. And I was really shocked because that wasn't what I was taught at university. And so um, I discovered that actually she's doing it in order to be a good mum because actually she's confusing paternity because male lions are infanticidal and by 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 mating with all the lions in the area she's she's able to um to to prevent that from happening and you talk about sex being a spectrum what do you mean by that 
Well, the manifestation of sex is 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 incredibly complex, and it's really there's a, there's a spectrum of bodies, brains, and behaviours. Um, and and you know you have animals, you know that are, you know they they produce both um, sperm and eggs, and you know there are there are plenty of animals that change sex, for example, and that's of where you see the the complexity and the plasticity of sex, and why these stereotypes are so ridiculous. Um, so, so take, for example, the anemone fish, uh, and you have a male and a female, and, and the, the female is dominant, but if you remove the, the, the dominant female, then the male turns into a female. And that transition, what's really fascinating about it and shows the complexity of sex, is that the transition happens first in the animal's brain, and the, and the, and the fish starts behaving as a female and is recognized as a female, but its gonads take up to a year to catch up and they remain male. So there you see that the fish's sexual identity and its sexuality and its sex behavior are female, but its biological sex are still male. So that sort of, that gives you a, a, an idea of, of the complexity of sex in nature. That is just fascinating. I had never heard of that before. So give us a sense of what the answer is. How do we get scientists to represent sex more accurately in the future? Well, the, answer, the short answer is diversity. That's what we need. It was it was females coming into science and and having the same education as men and and asking questions from a female perspective that have that have sparked this revolution. But really, what we need is 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 diversity in terms of cultures, genders, and sexualities in order to ask questions from many different perspectives, so that we appreciate the full diversity of the animal kingdom. Lucy Cook, what an enlightened conversation here. We thank you so much for joining us. You can buy her book. It is available now wherever books are sold. And still to come, a trip from San Francisco all the way to Hawaii, the remarkable women who just made history. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 Seven. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Ready for a little GMA ish promo? Okay, here we go. GMA 7A every day with Robin, George, and Michael. That's how you start the day. Boom! America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. And finally tonight, history made out on the ocean after a rowing team broke the female world record for a trip from San Francisco to Hawaii. Will Reeve caught up with them after the impressive feat. women rowing their boat into the record books. Everybody stay strong, beautiful, kind, brave. Rowers Libby Costello, Sophia Denison Johnston, Brooke Downs, and Adrian Smith make up the Lat 3-5 women's team. Stroke by grueling stroke, they rowed more than 2,400 nautical miles from San Francisco to Hawaii in 34 days, 14 hours, and 11 minutes. Their landfall, historic. They are the fastest all-female team to complete the journey. I feel like totally overwhelmed in the best way by love. And I'm also exhausted. They rode in two hour shifts, averaging just 90 minutes of sleep at a time, eating boil to order prepackaged meals, enduring seasickness, extreme wind and rough seas. We were what, Libby, 20, how many days in? 26. So 26 days in. And, and I was just like, I sat down and I was making food and I just like started crying. The women did it unassisted and had never rowed in the deep ocean before. 
but their legions of fans following the journey online put wind in the team's proverbial sails. On social media, the women are candid and funny. My vibe right now is just living life. I am yeah. just here to live life. I think something that I want people to take away is that these women are so incredible, but like we're not superhuman. Like there's nothing that we were born with that make us any different than anybody else. The crew never losing sight of their mission, breaking barriers. We inspired a bunch of different types of people, um, and that's really important. Just here to live life and break some records while doing it. Our thanks to Will Reeve for that. And that is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. America's number one news, ABC.